What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and the topic of what is D&D canon has become the all the rage of the discussion currently because Wizards of the Coast talked about in an article that they were decanonizing, for lack of a better term, everything that existed prior to the 5th edition rulebooks. So that's everything prior to 2014, all of that has been decanonized. Now there's an article that was written, uh, that was kind of originally announced in an interview. There's an article officially on the D&D Studio blog written by Chris Perkins, so we're gonna dive into that. There's also a quiz to learn what is canonical to fifth edition, so we'll see what we know. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about just a little bit is why I think that, I have opinions, I guess I should say, and obviously I'm entitled to said opinions, but I wanted to talk about why I have the opinion that I have in just a sec. Before we do that though, I wanted to talk to you about the sponsor for today's video, our good returning friends at Describe. If you're unfamiliar with Describe, Describe is an online tool to add immersive box style text to your campaign to save you time as a DM and also provide, uh, have a whole team of writers in your back pocket to pull out that, what's that descriptive thing you're trying to say without actually being able to come up with it yourself. See, there's a seduction line about learning magic. That's a new one. Goddess of the moon. There's magic items, places, locations, situations, characters. And because we're talking about canon, I thought it would be fun to read a pirate ship one. So with plenty of sail for holding the wind and canon specifically positioned to best rake the hull of a fat trading galleon, this pirate ship is a sleek predator in a sea chock full of the buccaneer's prey. For when a lookout on such a hapless vessel spies the Jolly Roger flying proudly from this mainmast, their captain knows that surrender or death are the two most likely outcomes for the day. So again, Describe has a variety of different pay methods where you can choose to go monthly, yearly, and pick and choose what you want or just get everything. And if you use the link in the description and coupon code NERDIMMERSION, you'll get 10% off your first purchase. So let's dive right into this article. It came out literally today. Uh, I guess it came out yesterday, actually, but I didn't hear anything about it till today because Wizards of the Coast doesn't do a great job promoting their own stuff. So I'm Chris Perkins, one of the studio uh, principal game architects, worked on Curse of Strahd, Icewind Dale, Wild Beyond the Witchlight. In this short blog post, I will describe our studio's position on canonicity. When we refer to D&D's canon, what we're talking about, and so on. So... Every expression of D&D has its own canon. This is kind of a throwaway answer, but I get it. It's my version of D&D is canon to my world, and your version of D&D is canon to your world. I don't think we needed to describe that, but I guess we do. So here it is. That's basically what it says. So um, our studio treats D&D the same way Marvel Studios treats its properties. I don't know if that's true, but the current edition of the D&D role-playing game has its own canon, as does every other expression of D&D. For example, what is canonical in 5th edition is not necessarily canonical in a novel, video game, movie, or comic book, and vice versa. This is true not only for lore, but art as well. This approach allows R.A. Salvador to write Driz novels without having to worry if his version of the Forgotten Realms perfectly matches what we do in the role-playing game. It means that a D&D video game can take elements from a series of novels and present them in a way that serves the game's needs rather than adhering to the sequence of events chronicled in the novels. Creatively, it's liberating. This approach also acknowledges that different media have unique challenges and requirements. Every edition of the role-playing game has its own canon as well. In other words, something that might have been treated as canonical in one edition is not necessarily canonical in another. And, mm -hmm. For example, the succubus was classified as a devil in 4th edition, even though it had been a demon in previous editions. It's also been said that every campaign that's ever been run in any of our published setting has its own canon. Your version of the Forgotten Realms has its own canon, which doesn't make it any less valid than anyone else's version. Elminster might be a lich in your campaign. Elminster might be a giant space hamster in mine. Both are acceptable and awesome. I think we get that, but all right. Key to our approach is the belief that the story belongs to the DM and the players, not us. Okay. Why not adopt the canon of earlier editions and be done with it? The most important reason we maintain our own continuity, separate from other expressions in earlier editions of D&D, is to lessen the burdens on DMs. It's not that we insist on creating everything ourselves, rather that we don't want DMs or players to feel they must read a novel, play a video game, or buy a third edition source book to enjoy our game to get the most out of our current line of products. We're judicious about creating or introducing certain types of lore for the same reason. DMs and players should be able to use our content without having to keep it up on some meta plot that stretches across novels, comics, and video games. Interesting that they chose to use a third edition rather than a fourth edition book in that part, but I digress. So my point is, 
This doesn't seem like something that's been true since the start. Because there was an entire series of novels. So this is something... Okay, let me just wax poetic about this for a little bit here. So over the course of the editions, and this is why I think a lot of... I, I think we all can accept, right? And if we can't, I have no answers for you. But I think we can all accept that their everybody's canon their game is canon to their own game i think we can all understand that and i get that and that's fine but just so you're aware in previous editions whenever there was the transition from one edition to the next they did some sort of massive in lore event that transitioned from one to another right so i think from second edition to third edition was the sundering right so that was a whole in-universe big huge thing that happened but that would allow them to change things from second edition into third edition and sort of make it make sense in terms of the lore and then from third edition to fourth edition was the spell plague and that, again, there was a lot of stuff going on there, and that explained a lot of the ways that magic and things changed from 3rd edition to 4th edition. And the novels and all the stuff reflected that. And then they went through, I think it was the second Sundering, was they developed a whole series of novels across by written by multiple authors to transition from 4th edition to 5th edition. And that supposedly, originally, again, maybe this all got changed, I don't know, was originally supposed to be, as far as I can recall, why magic items and things are so few and so rare in 5th edition because of the spell plague that happened in 4th edition, wiping out a lot of magic across the, wor the world, and then the second sundering, bringing on 5th edition canonically lore-wise, and then that between those two events was why magic items were all like super rare old things not something that was very easily craftable like they were back in 3rd edition. I don't really, I can't speak to 4th edition, but those were in my mind, and I could have sworn that I read this somewhere, that that was the change from 5th edition to magic items being so rare and unique and hard to come by, and that's why we're not flush with magic items. We have the process of attunement. Like, in older editions, it was like a video game, right? I had a head slot, a neck slot, a chest slot, an armor slot, a shoulder slot all these different slots for magic items and I could have one on each slot, there was no such thing as attunement. I was just limited on things and then sometimes you get really lucky and get what was an unslotted item, like something like, uh, like maybe you get like an anklet, a magic anklet, and it didn't take up a slot on your body. It just was a new item that you had. But anyway, my point being, I could have sworn that that was somewhere, that that was why magic items are the way they are because of the lore. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to get that out there, that there was a whole storytelling novel event to lead into 5th edition, and then for them to just say that we, we weren't doing that, why go through the effort of doing that if we're just going to throw it all out? I don't know. I don't have the right answer. We'll keep reading. You make your own call. 5th edition's canon begins with its core rulebooks. 5th edition's canon includes every bit of lore that appears in the most up-to-date printings of the 5th edition Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, and Dungeon Master Guide. Beyond these core rulebooks, we don't have a public-facing account of what is canonical in 5th edition because we don't want to overlearn our creator. So, apparently, if it's not in the Player's Handbook, the Monster Manual, or the Dungeon Master Guide, it's not canon either. So even all of the adventures and all of the source books that have been released since those three core books are technically not canon. The only existing canon for us, the layperson, is the core rule books. If you're not sure what else is canonical in 5th edition, let me give you a quick primer. Strahd von Zarevich canonically sleeps in a coffin, as vampires do. Menzo Berenzon is canonically a subterranean drow city under Loth's sway, as it has always been. And Zariel is canonically the Archduke of Avernus, at least for now. Conversely, anything that transpires during an Acquisitions Incorporated live game is not canonical in 5th edition, because we treat it the same as any other home game, even when members of the D&D studio are involved. See, that throws me off, because I believe it is either in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide? I think it's in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. They reference Omen Drawn as an open lord of Waterdeep. But I guess because Sword Coast Adventures Guide isn't the core rulebook, then it's not canonical? 
But then why provide a book that gives us lore and information about the Sword Coast if it doesn't count as canon? I'm just very confused. Canon is less about your enjoyment of the game and more about us using us being internally consistent. Okay. Whether or not a piece of art or lore is canonical in 5th edition should have little or no bearing on how most people interact with the game. If I told you that Markham Southwell is canonically the Sheriff of Bryn Shander circa 1492 DR, would that really impact your experience running or playing Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frostmaiden? I hope not. However, we use canonical lore internally to maintain consistency across our 5th edition products. Knowing that fire giants are canonically shorter yet more powerful than frost giants means that we don't need to rethink that bit of lore in upcoming products. Similarly, knowing that all trolls regenerate makes designing new troll variants easier. That just makes me more... I'm more confused now than I was just throwing out everything prior to 2014 and just keeping everything going forward. So, canon is only used internally by Wizards of the Coast across all of their products to keep it consistent, but we're not supposed to use it, but we can get a book, like a campaign setting, that gives us lore and canonicity to the world, like Sword Coast Adventures Guide, or things that are described in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and none of that is canon. I'm just... Okay, I'm moving on. I, I, I really... I'm not upset, I'm just thoroughly confused maybe somebody in the comments can explain it to me better i'm sure someone will try but this is me asking comments so you don't have to feel like you need to come out and explain it to me i'm asking what's your interpretation so the game's long history is known to us those among us who are fortunate enough to become shepherds or stewards of the DD game must train ourselves to become art and lore experts so that we know we're being faithful to the game's past and we're moving in new directions we decide, based on our understanding of the game's history and audience, what artwork or lore to pull forward, what artwork or lore needs to change, and what artwork or lore should be buried so deep that it never rises to see the light of day. We have a couple of guiding principles. If the artwork holds up or the lore has been true in every past edition of the game, we think twice about changing it. If the artwork or lore hasn't withstood the test of time, we can update or discard it. The number of eyes on a stock beholder has been consistent throughout D&D's history. No need to meddle with perfection, I say. On the other hand, if you're familiar with the old maps of Waterdeep, you might recall that one of the seedier avenues was named Slut Street. When we updated the map of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, we gave that street a new name. The old name was never good to begin with and does not stand the test of time. And then take the 5e Cannon Commando quiz, which we're going to do. <sighs> All right. I, I'm still a little, a little confused. Um... But we're being paid faithful to games past when we're moving in a new direction. We decide based on our understanding. See, that also makes me... There used to be a part of the Dragon Plus... Pod, or the Dragon Talk podcast with Chris Perkins, sometimes Matt Cernet and other folks, called Lore You Should Know. And then I guess they're not... I don't think they're doing that anymore. And I guess that's because you shouldn't know the lore because it doesn't count. I'm just... Okay. So, for each question, choose a correct answer. Uh, stock beholder has 10 eyes. Which of the following is not a canonical domain of dread? I'm gonna say Las Vegas. <laughs> Which of the following cities is not a member of the Lord's Alliance? Albuquerque. In 5th edition, where do Modrons come from? Mechanus. What has caused the cataclysm known as the Morning? Uh, and I'm gonna say, I think we don't know. Okay, so... Wait a minute. Oh, 11 eyes. I'm a dummy. I forgot the central one, you big dummy. I thought about the eye stalks. I didn't think about the central one. Las Vegas, Albuquerque, Mechanis. We don't know. Okay. So I'm hereby permitted to apply for open positions in the D&D studio because I got that one wrong because I'm a dummy. I don't know, folks. Take it with a grain of salt. I'm just confused. Me personally, I get it. I, I fully understand the concept of wanting to, quote, lower the bar of entry, meaning that, like, you don't need to understand 50 years worth of canonicity, novels, obscure source books, conversations Ed Greenwood had in his kitchen. Like, you don't need to know all that stuff to understand. And I, I think that that makes sense. But... 
I think the process of what we just saw of like you can like I could pick up, I could go to Barnes and Noble or Amazon or wherever, and I could pick up a Sword Coast Adventures guide. I know there's really no reason to do it because they seem to just dislike that book. And I could read through that and it tells me the lore of the gods of the Forgotten Realms and what happened to the gods. It tells me about the history, it even talks about the sundering, the spell plague, all that stuff in that book. But per this article, it's not one of the three core rule books, so it doesn't count. I just, I don't know. Anyway, I love you guys, and you're great. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Uh, I mentioned it in the last video, but I'll mention it here again. I have a bunch, and I forgot to bring them down here again, damn it. I have a bunch of Nerd Immersion stickers, like laptop stickers, high quality laptop stickers that I bought, and I would love to share them with all of you. Now, if I have leftovers, I'll, I'll either, I'll order more before I go to Gen Con, so I'll have some with me there. But in the meantime, if you want to mail me a self-addressed stamped envelope, so if you're unfamiliar with that process, you take an envelope and you write, uh, you know, you write, your address on it and you write my address in the corner and you put a stamp on it and you stick that inside an envelope that you then mail to me then i open up your envelope take out that one that's already got the stamp self-addressed stamp that's that part i put the sticker in and i send it back and you get a sticker if you want to include a note or anything else with that you're more than welcome to but you don't have to and i've got these stickers and i want to get them out in the world so that we can spread nerd immersion and then, hey, if people start seeing that symbol, they'll be like, what's that? Push more people to the channel. So, also, hey, if you haven't subscribed, consider doing so. Thank you, Describe, for sponsoring this video, and I will see you all next time.